Today we're going to be looking at three short stories written by H.G. Wells and published in the 1890s. These follow on quite naturally from last week's text, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is often defined as part of the imperial gothic. That is, late 19th century fiction set in the British Empire that employs and adapts elements drawn from gothic novels, such as a gloomy, forbidding atmosphere, brutal, tyrannical men, spectacular forms of violence or punishment, and the presence of the occult or the supernatural. In this subset of the Gothic, then, the conventional elements of the genre, tyranny, entrapment, violence, are mapped onto the realities of empire and colonialism, enslavement and massacre, imperial seizure and control, and other atrocities committed under empire. As we discussed last week, Dracula is part of a wave of reverse colonization novels, a term taken from Stephen Arata that were published in the 1880s and 1890s, which depict a foreign and sometimes colonial other turning the processes of empire and colonialism back on England, threatening the English with the same violence and tyranny that the empire had enacted on so many other nations throughout the 19th century. And the social and political fears that we see coming through in the Imperial Gothic and reverse colonization novels are really grounded in 19th century science, which is the context around H.G. Wells' work that we're going to discuss in this lecture. Charles Darwin gave the 19th century the idea of survival of the fittest. But towards the end of the century, many Brits began to worry that they no longer represented the fittest population on the globe. Darwinian science made it clear that being more civilized, as they believed themselves to be, was not the same as being the best adapted for survival. In fact, it might be the opposite. The so-called savagery of the peoples that the British encountered in Africa, Australia, Oceania, and other parts of the world seemed to many to represent a kind of physical and martial fitness that the British and the British Empire no longer possessed. The fear then was that in going out into the wider world, they were going to encounter stronger populations, more fit populations that would be able to supersede the British. Now in the stories we are reading for this week, H.G. Wells extends the fears of the Imperial Gothic from other human populations to other species and even other kingdoms of life. So across all three stories we've read, we can see this fear that humanity in total might not be the fittest to survive in a harsh and competitive world. Other animals and other forms of life, like plants, might be able to supersede us, to compete with us for resources, and in fact, wipe us out. As Wells writes in The Empire of the Ants, which we read this week, it was the inhuman immensity of this land that astonished and oppressed him. He knew the skies were empty of men. The stars were specks in an incredible vastness of space. He knew the ocean was enormous and untamable. But in England, he had come to think of the land as man's. In England, it is indeed man's. The wild things live by sufferance, grow on lease. Everywhere the roads, the fences, and absolute security runs. In an atlas, too, the land is man's, and all colour to show his claim to it, in vivid contrast to the universal independent blueness of the sea. He had taken it for granted that a day would come when everywhere about the earth, plough and culture, light tramways and good roads, and ordered security would prevail. But now he doubted. Wells stated this even more explicitly in his non-fiction scientific writing, as in the essay Zoological Retrogression, in which he insisted that nature is, in unsuspected obscurity, equipping now some humble creature with wider possibilities of appetite, endurance, or destruction to rise in the fullness of time and sweep Homo away into the darkness from which his universe arose. And in the quotation from The Empire of the Ants, we can see the importance of empire to this shift in mindset. And from imagining as 
Holroyd does, that the world has been conquered by mankind to realizing that in fact nature might be stronger than we think and may, nature might be in competition with us rather than us ruling over it. England, the narrator suggests in this quotation, has long been tamed. Wild things live there only by sufferance amongst the roads, fences and hedges. But the ever-expanding British Empire introduced the British to very different cultures and very different landscapes. In Brazil, Holroyd realizes, for the first time, the insignificance of man on a global scale, the vast stretches of the world over which mankind has no dominion. Here in this moment, we see Wales engaging with a fundamental shift that occurred over the course of the 19th century in how people understood their relationship to the natural world. Prior to the Enlightenment, and for many people stretching long past the Enlightenment and into the 19th century, the West understood humanity's relationship to nature through a Christian lens. In the book of Genesis, God gives the earth to Adam to rule over. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In this biblical account, mankind is not part of the natural world, but rather lord over it, separate and in control. All living things in the sea, the skies, and the land are made for the benefit of mankind. And Adam is given specific instruction not just to use natural resources, for his own benefit, but to subdue the earth. This is a hierarchical and tyrannical relationship. An exploitation is absolutely built into this relationship, but until the 19th century, humanity didn't really understand the consequences of the widespread exploitation of the natural world. If all living things were individually and specially created by God to serve a purpose, as the Bible tells us they were, it seemed absolutely ridiculous to most Victorians to imagine that natural resources could either be destroyed or used up. Extinction was not a concept that existed before the late 18th century, and it didn't enter the popular understanding of the world until the 1820s and 30s. However, two key scientific ideas of the 19th century really changed how mankind understood our relationship to nature and our place within the world, and made it clear that the natural world could be exploited to the point of destruction, that extinction was a possibility, and that our place as at the top of the food chain was not a foregone conclusion. These two key ideas are uniformitarianism and deep time and evolution and natural selection. Uniformitarianism caused a seismic shift in the way people understood their relationship to the earth. Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, which was published in 1830, popularized the theory of uniformitarianism, which suggested that the changes observed within the record of the earth occurred slowly over long periods of time. And this view was in complete contrast with the previously accepted theory of catastrophism, which posited that um, changes in geology were caused by sudden and catastrophic events, like the flood described in the book of Genesis. So prior to this understanding of the slow changes in the earth, um, biblical time, which suggested the world was only 6,000 years old, could be reconciled with scientific time, with our understanding of the actual age of the earth. Uniformitarianism, in contrast, introduced the concept of deep time, or the idea that the world had existed for millions or billions of years, scientists didn't quite agree during this period, long before mankind ever showed up. So the 19th century public was confronted for the very first time with this idea that the earth had existed long before humanity's arrival.
take a second just to imagine what that might be like. You've always been told that the world was made for man, and suddenly you're confronted with the millions and millions, the billions of years that the earth existed before us. It was a horrifying thought for many Victorians. And humanity's belief in its own centrality was further shaken by mounting evidence for evolution, or the transmutation of species. The concept of deep time allowed for the possibility of gradual change within species. So uniformitarianism allows scientists to come up with the idea of evolution. The theory of evolution was widely popularized in England by Robert Chambers in his 1844 Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation which we see on the left here. In Vestiges, Chambers presented evidence for the evolution of species, but he didn't suggest the mechanism by which that evolution occurred. This explanation is what Charles Darwin provided 15 years later in On the Origin of Species, which introduced the theory of natural selection. Pre-Darwinian evolution, like that in the Vestiges, was often viewed as progressive, with species evolving towards ever better versions of themselves. And this sort of progression towards a future state of perfection could be reconciled with the idea of a benevolent creator. It could be reconciled with the main theories of, could be reconciled with the main beliefs of Christianity. Darwin's theory of natural selection, which pointed to random mutation and competition for limited resources as the mechanism of change, could not. With natural selection, there's just no room for even an indirect form of design. The laws of nature operate without concern for future goals and with an apparent disregard for the well-being of individual organisms. New characteristics appear more or less at random and are whittled down by a merciless struggle for existence to leave only those with survival value. This is evolution by trial and error, not by design. As Darwin himself admitted, which groups will ultimately prevail no man can predict, for we know that many groups formerly most extensively developed have now become extinct. Thus, mankind couldn't see themselves continuously progressing towards perfection because the possibility of extinction was always present. And this, again, is something that they realized over the course of the 19th century, this idea that quite advanced and extensively developed species had been completely wiped out, either uh, by man or before man, as they saw with dinosaurs and other prehistoric forms of life. And this was quite a startling idea to them, that no amount of evolution, no amount of advancement necessarily protected you from extinction. So uniformitarianism demonstrated to the 19th century public that humanity had not always existed, and extinction suggested that humanity would not always exist. And this is one of the aspects of 19th century science that Victorians found most troubling. Once humanity was no longer a special creation of a benevolent god, it meant nature didn't exist for us, but in us. We're merely part of a natural world, rather than lords over it. Genesis promised that man would always be at the top of the food chain, but Darwinian theory gave lie to that promise. The possibility that that place could be taken from us was a really difficult concept for many people at the time, and, of course, since. And it's this possibility that Wells explores in the three stories we've read this week and in the rest of his body of work, in novels that you might have encountered on previous courses like The Island of Dr. Moreau, The Time Machine, or The War, War of the Worlds. As J.M. Ong argues, Wells's stories query human exceptionalism and species hierarchy in order to introduce the notion that humans, too, are vulnerable to extermination. And it's this idea that feeds into another subset of the Gothic that developed in the 19th century, the Eco-Gothic, which we're going to look at in the second part of this lecture.